Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. In the early morning of June 28, 2009, about 100 soldiers from the Central American nation of Honduras forced their way into the bedroom of Honduran President Manuel Zelaya, kidnapped him while he was still in his pajamas, and forced him into exile in another country. This military coup, backed by conservative business leaders, overthrew a freely elected president. Latin American nations unanimously denounced this military coup against democracy. U.S. politicians and news media have distorted the realities so the American people do not understand what really happened or why. This crisis continues now, more than a year later. During the next hour, we will get beyond the simplistic explanations and share information that you will not have seen from other sources. I'm happy to welcome two guests, Nina Morano and Bruce Wilkinson, who are well informed and who've learned even more about Honduras from having spent time there firsthand. Welcome, good to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nina Morano went to Honduras in 1989 with a women's delegation and again in August 2010 with Witness for Peace. She has extensive first hand knowledge of many Latin American countries and she's active in the Fellowship of Reconciliation and other peace groups. Bruce Wilkinson was in Honduras in late January 2010 when the new president was being inaugurated. He went with a delegation from Rights Action, an international group that focuses on Central America. He works in Olympia with the Latin America Solidarity Organization. So it's good to have you both here. I want to make sure that people watching know where Honduras is, because sometimes people get confused about which uh, Central American nation is which. We have a map over here that shows the southern tip of Florida here, Cuba, northern coast of South America, and the heavy line shows the boundary of Honduras, which is in the middle of Central America. Let me pull that aside and you can see the boundaries here. It's got the Caribbean actually north of it uh, and has borders with Guatemala and uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador and the Pacific coast out here. So. Uh, it has a lot of neighbors. Um, Nina, can you give us a little bit of background about the history of Honduras from like colonial times or ancient times to... Well, I don't know how far back I can well, go, but um, Honduras has uh, indigenous groups, as all Central American, Latin American countries do, as we do, Mexico. And um, so until the Spanish invaded, they actually lived quite peacefully. And... Um, then the Spanish invaded, and they got rid of the Spanish, I think, 18. They're just celebrating that now. But anyway, September 15th is the big date. And um, Honduras became sort of the poster child for the United States, the prototype of Banana Republic. Its main export was bananas. Um, it pretty well was in line with whatever America wanted, America got. And um, then along came all the troubles in Guatemala and Salvador, and Honduras had many people fleeing from Salvador, fleeing the oppression in Salvador, and um, crossed the river, the Lempa River, and there were several terrible, terrible massacres. And then there were a group of Salvadorans that did get into Honduras, and, uh, but we were behind the Honduran policy of not allowing the Salvadorans in. Yeah, we meaning so, the United States government, United not, States government. not right. you Bruce. Well, we're all part of it. <laughs> yeah, they did it <laughs> but, in our names and with our tax right. dollars. And um, anyway, this was in the 80s, mostly, uh -huh. when, the, when all the, the troubles were happening. And I was in Central America with the, um, well, actually through Mexico, too, uh, with a convoy, convoy of women to Central America with 22, 22 vehicles, buses, trucks, and 69 women, and we took aid to all these women groups through Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras. We couldn't get into Salvador at the time, it was still bad, and ended up in Nicaragua, 
And so um, we were in, um, in Honduras and met with Honduran women at that time. They actually rescued us from the Honduran soldiers that were with us in our, in our vehicles with their M16s. Mm. And, uh, and they whisked us away. And so we had a full day in Honduras, in Tegucigalpa, the capital, with mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Hond Honduran activists, women, female activists. And I, I met two people there that I later met on this trip. That and the um, one was a doctor, Almendares, Juan Almendares. And did you? I don't know whether you met. Did you meet him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. a very, very vocal, very, very learned man. Uh -huh. And um, anyway, so that's my history yeah. in Honduras, and the fact that I um, I mentioned that it was um, we were. Driving, I was driving. I was drove a, a little bus, a 19-person bus, too, and uh, saw some kids along the road that had orange hair, and I thought, "Oh dear, the Americans have been here," you know, because, and I thought that, you know, but it turned out that they actually, that a nurse on the trip said, "No, no, they have orange hair because they have a lack of protein in their diet," yeah. and evidently, you lose something in your hair, and it t turns right. orange when you lack total protein, and they had. So yeah. that was my introduction to Honduras, that and, and roadways that we would be driving along and suddenly the road would disappear and you would be on the road bed. So I immediately understood the poverty, uh -huh. just, you know, like yeah. that. So. And the United States had used Honduras as a launching pad for during the Reagan years right. here for Reagan's war against the Government the of Sandinistas, of the Nicaragua Contras, they had, had progressive. And Contras were in that part of the country with uh, because we crossed the Nicaraguan border, yeah. border and we saw, yeah. we saw Americans actually, uh, with with Contras. Yeah, in the, that the Contras part. were the terrorists that, the, that Reagan was funding with our tax dollars, right. and the, the CIA had Guardia, organized to, the to, old to over, Samosas, Samosas Guardia. Yeah, the old yeah, yeah the old dictators' activities that we were still doing. Yeah. Well. Honduras had a difficult struggle and, and finally emerged with a democracy, and they had this election in 2005 that was free and fair election, and they elected a guy named, named Manuel Zelaya to be president. Um, and although he came from a wealthy family, he somehow got his, um, got his bearings and, and did some progressive things. Tell us... Uh, what he did for his country when he was president from 2005 till 2009. Well, Zelaya, Zelaya was part of the, the two-party system that they have in, in Honduras, you know, and he and both parties are controlled by the elites. This is like a a country that's that where the elites control like uh, both parties, and they switch back and forth. And uh, and Zelaya was just going to be one more uh, president like that. He's part of the Liberal Party which is like the slightly more progressive party, I guess. You could call it progressive at all, which it isn't. And, <laughs> and you know, he was, he was just known, he was kind of like a, you know, a, he, he seemed kind of like a, had that persona of like, like that George Bush had, sort of had. You know, he, he wore a big cap on his cowboy, head, his cowboy, cowboy cap. Yeah. He had the whole cowboy persona. He was a rancher, and he comes from that, uh, from that whole, uh, area of Honduras where the ranching was really big. So, you know, he, he was, we thought it was going to be all the same thing, and at first it seemed like it was, but then he started changing things. And some of it kind of seemed to come out of, like, necessity. Like, one of the things that he did, which was kind of shocking, was he joined ALBA, which is the Bol Bolivarian Alliance for Our Americas. And that's a trading group uh, along with Venezuela, Cuba, um, Bolivia, and a few Caribbean nations, and also uh, so it's Ecuador. an alternative Ecuador. to the mm -hmm. it's an alternative to the U.S. dominated quote free trade stuff that actually benefits the U.S. corporations. Yes, exactly, exactly. And uh, this is a, a, a lot of this. It made a lot of economic sense at the time, actually, in a certain way. Um, you know, this freed up more uh, through through with the help of like Venezuela. Um, the Honduras was able to get cheaper oil um, through through uh, uh, Venezuela's programs and Petro Caribe, which is uh, another another group, and um, 
And when they were able to do that, they were able to buy oil on like 20 year loans at like 1% interest. It was like a, it was a sort of solidarity um, giving that was like really uh, helpful for them. And that freed up, freed up money for them to like invest in their, their public schools. Um, they were also able to, to help with uh, um, other things like um, another program that was put in place was they were given like cattle and were able to, to raise uh, a calf for each family. And once you raise birth the calf, you pass the, the, the cow on to the next family who then was able to raise another calf. It was, it was an interesting program. So they had lots of interesting programs like that going along. And right before, um, in, in around January of 2009, they, he increased minimum wage by 60%. And that was just a, a big affront to, to the <laughs> powers that be, so to speak. Uh -huh. you know, they, they would not put up with that. Um, and, but, you know, Zelaya, who, who uh, at the time was, was working on the, under this whole, he was becoming part of like this whole group of Latin American voices that were saying, you know, things have changed. You know, we're not going to accept uh, this sort of situation anymore where like the U.S. dominates our economy and tells us what to do. And instead, you know, they were like, you know, we need to develop as a society. We need to educate our people. We need to raise the standard of living for all people. Mm -hmm. And we need to, to decrease the massive amount of poverty. And there was an incredible amount of poverty right. in Honduras, and there still is. Tell, tell us about the, the coup then that happened in 2009, end of June of 2009. Um, the, the, uh, there, there, there were some issues floating around about uh, uh, trying to update the Constitution and stuff, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But what, tell us about the coup, and then we'll get into the background behind it. What actually happened on June 28 and those next few days? Well, they, they came in, um, and they took him out of his, what the, you said, in his, in his pajamas, yeah. and took him up to a base called Palmarola, where there are 500 American soldiers for a drug interdiction. Uh, Honduras is quite the drug route through Central America, particularly in the northern part of the, of the country. And, um, and they flew him out. And he uh, almost got back in a little bit later. And then he did get back in. And then he was in the Bra Brazilian embassy. And they did all sorts of things. They, they had music outside the Brazilian embassy. And this would be the, the Honduran, the coup government of Honduras. The coup government. Was right. harassing the Was Brazilian. harassing and, uh, yeah. and just doing all sorts of things. And, uh, and, and they, then there was a whole thing that we set up with Costa Rica that he was going to talk to Michelete, who was the guy who had planned the coup. And, um, and anyway, and that didn't go anyplace. Um, though Zelaya was very amenable, but Michelete said he was, but then he was. And, and they were just stalling for time until the elections. When, when Zelaya would have stepped down, because under Honduran law, mm -hmm. you can only serve one term. And so they complained that they said, well, they had to get rid of him because he wanted to be president for life, and which was not true. And he simply wanted to have a constituent assembly. This was only to have people come together and talk right. about changing the Constitution, which had not been changed. And it was so much a military thing that the military actually deliver the vote boxes in Honduras, yeah. and they pick up the vote. Yeah. I mean, so they have a lot of power. And... And they were just voting, the people were voting, and it was the day that they took him out that was the day of the vote. Right. To, you know. So this, the, 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 the vote that you're talking about right here is a vote about whether it would be a good idea to have... Just to have a constituent. A yeah. Not so to change the, it, just this, to meet. This, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And the news media accounts that I kept hearing and seeing from the U.S., Confused that stuff. They, made, they, oh, they, they repeated yeah. this. He wants to be he president wanted to for change life. Change the constitution. Claim which is not true. Yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. And the constitution had been there since 1982, and it was grossly out of date. And there had been a, quite a number of uh, amendments, reforms, fixes, and more needed to be done. And so he was looking at 
whether the public would support the idea of creating. Right. Uh, People were very excited uh, uh, about it. They were what, very what excited. What we would call in this country a constitutional convention, yeah. and they call yeah. it a different name. Yeah, there was, a, I mean, there was a, it was a pretty straightforward uh, uh, vote that was going to happen. It was more like a, a poll. They yeah, were it was polling. A pub public opinion yeah. polling yeah. more than what we think of as like an election yes. vote. Right. It was right. a non binding yeah. referendum on whether or not in the November, and this is June, whether or not. Yeah. They thought, the people thought that in November there should be another vote as to whether or not to have a constitutional assembly. And that yeah. would be a time. And then if, if the people voted for that and then voted in November that, to have a constitutional assembly, then they'd have to have elections again right. uh, for people to be part of the constitutional right. assembly. And so this was like a long, long process, process that takes, yeah. takes a yeah. lot of years of change. Yeah. But you know the Constitution of Honduras was made in 1982, and it, it, it came out of that was right when uh, Honduras stopped being a military dictatorship and came into quote unquote democracy. And the Honduran military didn't immediately give away uh, its power at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was a long process over several decades, yeah. and it was really coming kind of like when Zelaya took power was a lot different than when Zelaya was starting off. Uh, it was finally to, at the point where like, the military was no longer running all the different affairs of the country. Um, they had finally given over uh, politi uh, political power um, to, to, uh, uh, to a government. And this was also because of economics. You understand there's a free trade section in Honduras, in San Pedro Sula, the second largest city. And these are the maquilas. Okay, it's like what the United States has along the Mexican border. Exactly, and so, and that's where yeah. Gap, and you're just a whole list. I mean, if you if if you look in your tags, yeah, you know, a lot of your clothes are going to have been made by very young women, 12, 13, yeah. 14, because there's yeah. no age thing, in San Pedro Sula. Okay. Well, that's where Kathy, you know, in the 90s, the Kathy Lee Gifford. Scandal. Oh, yes. That was okay. a, about Honduras. Okay. She had child labor in Honduras making her line of, of designer clothing. Okay. So when the coup happened, and it's a military coup, mm -hmm. and the uh, so they kidnapped him, they hauled him out of the country. The Congress picked the the head of Congress, uh, Micheletti, to be the interim president. Mm -hmm. And how did? the rest of Latin America respond to this? Well, they <laughs> thought they had gotten rid of that happening in Latin America. Yeah, it was it, the first coup in, I don't know, since the, uh, since the 90s, yeah, it, it uh, you know, a long, long time. Well, yeah, there had been yeah. real progress toward right. democracy. There had been real progress. There were, Guatemala always had a little, you know, well, maybe, maybe, you know, but, but there had not been a coup for a, yeah. quite a long time, since the 80s, yeah. actually, and then suddenly, yeah. Woo! And so the OAS. The Organization of American States. The Organization of American States, which is not just Central America, but also Latin America, yeah. and also Canada and the United States mm -hmm. are in the Organization of American States. And um, they voted to expel Honduras. Huh. Honduras was out mm -hmm. because they had done this illegitimate, illegal action. Yeah. And... Um, you want me to go on about that? Well, <laughs> the, yeah, the tell, tell us a bit more. It, it was it was just like a worldwide condemnation. Absolutely, the United Nations General United Assembly, Nations and Senate. Everybody. overwhelmingly by by acclamation, they passed the thing saying this is illegitimate. We don't accept that. That's not acceptable. We want democracy back. Right, right, right. And, and also our government, um, that President Obama was horrified and said he was horrified, uh, but that only lasted for a couple of days. And um, we had, there were other forces. The Hondurans, the elite had actually had hired a lobbying firm in Washington, D.C. several weeks before the actual coup. And they had hired this lobbying firm to, to put forward Honduras as being in deep trouble with this president, et cetera, to mm -hmm. set up the thing. They're very, they have a lot of money and they're yeah. very shrewd. And they know, they know America, they travel a lot here. Yeah. And, you know, it's, um, 
it's the ten. How many families did you say? Oh, about ten or a dozen yeah. families. Yeah, yeah the controlling they, families. And they intermarry, the and then the businessmen come in, and they yeah. make a lot of money. And and this know. this was this, but let's not hit hit around the bush on this. You know, the U.S. knew that this was happening and allowed it to happen. People uh, call this Obama's first coup and since he's been in power, you know, and then maybe that's a little unfair because there's the, the people that were in in the positions of power in Latin America and, and uh, as far as U.S. appointed positions were all people that were, elect, that were selected under Bush and they were holdovers. Um, but it's, nonetheless, this happened and, you know, a coup doesn't happen in, in, in the Western Hemisphere without the U.S. knowing about it. Uh, it just, it just it won't happen. And if the U.S. wanted to, uh, to revert, reverse this coup, at any point in time, the U.S. could have done it. And that, that still remains true to today. You know, at, at, if the U.S. had really condemned the coup, then the U.S. could have immediately stopped it and reversed right. it and put Zelaya back in power. It would have taken one call. And, yeah. and the political will was, you know, from all over the world was there. But so the only thing that was lacking was the U.S. political will, and Which, that and the U.S. political will was was totally lacking. And they did they did have to cut military aid, because that's part of you know, the law, that if there's a coup in the military. Mm -hmm. However, since the, quote unquote elections, in which thirty percent mm -hmm. voted, um, they have restored that military aid. And that was the, an election that occurred. Uh, last, in, in November, November of 2009, November. and we'll talk about that in a bit. And that was mm -hmm. sort of the fig leaf of legitimacy right. over this mm. coup. So the, how did the U.S. press, uh, the mainstream U.S. press, how did they report these goings on at the time of the coup and since? Well, that this man was very radical, Zelaya, because he had doings with Hugo Chavez uh -huh. of Venezuela, who was the demon of the American yeah. press, or the Latin American demon of the American press, uh -huh. and he was unduly influenced by him, uh -huh. um, which was really not necessarily, it was, wasn't true. Uh, and uh, however, they did have an arrangement with Alba and Petro Carib for the oil, and, uh, and the people were very excited about that, uh -huh. and they were very excited to join the mainstream of Latin America yeah. and of Central America, and to you know, feel that they were being brought in mm -hmm. to things finally, yeah. Yeah. and um, but this was this was reported by the press as you know. I mean, Chavez has become sort of the Castro of Central yeah. America yeah. of, a, of yeah. Latin America. So if you if you, if you get along with Chavez, then you get right. uh, uh, it's guilt by association kind of thing. Right. They made this demon. Right. Except yeah. actually, they're only everybody's getting along with Chavez now, except maybe Peru. Uh -huh. But everybody else is getting yeah. along with Chavez yeah. because he's he's very reasonable about the oil and he's he's got a lot of imagination and he has set up banking things for, and he's essentially trying to just set up things that just involve Latin America right. that are not controlled by the United States. Right, and that's and, and that's an affront to the, the powers that be in this country. That is yeah. the big problem. The, the stuff that I saw in the press was making uh, just gross distortions about. The, the notion of, of the Constitution of Honduras, oh, yeah. the, uh, the, the Constituent Assembly, or the allegation of a uh, president for life, all these things that, that, that are not true, but the mainstream press in this country just seem to report kind of like the, uh, uh, the, the coup government's talking points. Oh, yeah. And, and, and not the accurate stuff. And it was just so frustrating because I'd have to look at the, at the peace movement press or the alternative mm -hmm. press to find, to find the, what was really going on. Well, you know, Lonnie, Lonnie Davis was, the, was hired by PR firms that, um, by, uh, from Honduras, and he was like a, a campaign advisor of Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, friend of the Clintons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they, they did a great job with PR spin. Now, you know, they went, went really far on like uh, discrediting Zelaya in the media, you know, they, but, but it, it's, it's hard to, to dislike the guy, you know, it's hard to find something really wrong with him, you know, people, um, they, you know, at, 
the couple days after the coup happened, they rolled out a, a resignation letter from Zelaya, you know, in the press, and the press just ate it up, you know, uh, went around the claiming that he had signed yeah. a letter Never resigning, signed. right, saying that Never he was mentally it. ill or something uh -huh. like that, and you know, and then the whole thing came up as being like completely made up, completely right. fabricated in the in the Honduran Congress under Micheletti, you know, to completely backed up this this resignation letter, and then it was, was turned out to be. Yeah. Bogus. Uh, was, bogus. Yeah. Then, then yeah. they then they had to to back off of it. Yeah. But the damage was done in the media. Right. right. And they fired. They fired five judges who objected to what was going on. Uh -huh. And then the Supreme Court rubber stamped the coup. Yeah. You know. And then they also there was a, a prosecuting attorney and uh, something like the state's attorney or something like that, mm -hmm. and they got rid of him too. Uh -huh. So, so, so it, yeah, it, it sounds, it's a little bit like, uh, uh, for those who remember the Watergate thing, the Saturday Night Massacre, where yeah. Nixon oh, and yeah. his people were firing all the people who were uh, opposing yeah. his corruption. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, after the coup, uh, they installed uh, Roberto Micheletti to be the interim president until the November 2009 elections. And um, what did he do? Can you summarize uh, what, what he was doing? Uh, between there and and uh... well, he was holding down the fort. <laughs> yeah. But he uh, and I th I told you that he actually made his nephew, the mayor of San Pedro Sula, which uh -huh. was the second largest city in in, uh -huh. in Honduras. I mean, and um, and he um, he was um, very he was the the general who actually led who actually was the one who grabbed Soleil and put him on the plane. Um, and he, um, he became the head of the communications in the government. Right. So he got all the, con and, and the control is pretty, is pretty thorough from the top. Yeah, well, they've been cl closing down TV stations and right. killing journalists right. and a bunch of stuff. They've been the trying to The second largest well, amount of journalists in, in the world. Micheletti yeah. it was a dictator. He, yes. he, you know, I mean, we installed a dictator. You know, he wasn't uh, directly in control of the military, but he was. The military had the coup, and then Micheletti was was put to to run the the government uh, by the military, and he rolled back um, almost every progressive piece of legislation that Zelaya had passed. You know, the, he right. went quickly to like cut the uh, to. Sit, he cut back, uh, made laws against uh, women's rights, uh, made laws against uh, gays, um, and cooperatives, and land cooperatives. cooperatives. Yeah, he he cut back on on land deals. Um, he also stole dropped out of Alba. Yeah, and he also stole some money from a health oh, system right. and they used it for something Denga. else. They have a big uh, problem now with dengue, which is dengue the fever. That they, dengue yeah. fever. Uh, when I was there, it was just enormous, and then it, it came out that Micheletti had actually raided the health, <laughs> the health ministry, uh -huh. and they didn't have the money they thought they would have to fight dengue with, and so that was sort of a scandal. Uh -huh. But it didn't come out in the regular newspaper. It came out in the progressive newspaper, yeah. uh, which is not as clandestine as one would guess because I managed to find a copy at the airport. Huh. <laughs> so, uh, so they're not quite as thorough as they would yeah, like to be, yeah. but they have clandestine um, radio stations all over the country. Yeah. So the people themselves with low power, localized Loc radio. Uh, it's like 40 kilometers or something uh -huh. like that. We went down and visited one, and, and we took, they had been off the air. They had 300 policemen come in and, and actually circle their little the radio station, which yeah. was like, you know, what, 8 by 12 or something uh -huh. concrete building that they had built. And um, you know, and put a tape around it saying this is a crime scene. Oh. And they took they took removed the tape and put it up in the station. It's very <laughs> it's very attractive. Oh. But, but so and and but they were doing there there was just a massive amount of repression of human rights and people were getting awful. beat up and mm -hmm. killed and uh, and they were doing this as a way of it's like what the death squads were doing in El Salvador 
a couple right. days before but where they kill somebody and then they make sure that you see the body at a prominent oh, yeah. location. Mm -hmm. And that's a warning to the rest of you. Don't you dare disagree with our new right. coup government. We're, we're running things. Yeah. Uh, but remember also that we didn't mention how small Honduras is. Honduras yeah. is, well, it's they say seven million now, and mm -hmm. and of course, and most of the population, as with most of the third world countries, are it's under eighteen. Uh -huh. And so you have a whole youth movement there, that's that you know that doesn't know from the eighties. Or the 90s. That's right. You know? Yeah. So this is, and this youth group has been galvanized. The young man that was running the radio station we went to was 19. Wow. You know? Yeah, so that population of their country is roughly the same size as the state of Washington population. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that and that's really interesting for comparisons of like, you know, it's, it's great that the European Union and the United Nations and all the countries in Latin America uh, minus the United States, condemn the coup like outright, completely, no strings attached. Uh, but the really most important thing is that the people of the country have shown an amazing uh, amount of dislike for this coup. This is not, that was another thing that was in the media coverage in the United States, which is that. People in Honduras wanted Zelaya gone. Oh yeah, you know? they that did. was they another, another big it. lie. They wanted yeah. the military to throw them out. They yeah. wanted the the military to like put in a curfew that was from uh, six a.m. to to six p.m. After that, you're not allowed to leave your house for mm -hmm. for several weeks. Uh -huh. You know they wanted. You know that that's what the the newspaper would tell yeah. tell the tell the United people in the United States when exactly the opposite. Hundreds of thousands of people were taken to the streets. There was uh, huge worker strikes. The massive amounts of, of workers went on strike, um, and and all this wasn't really reported with the sort of like emphasis in right. the United States media, if it was covered at all. It was covered as like this is the minority group. These are the outcasts. These are like the small groups, agitators. Uh -huh. I mean, you, when I was down there, you know, and this is. Uh, Eight months after the coup, there there was a march that was two hundred thousand people strong, um, and that's a big march. And, and, and yeah. remember, this is the population the size of Washington. Yeah. So you imagine having a, a march, in a Olympia. protest march of two hundred thousand people in this just from this state yeah. alone. I mean, the WTO yeah. protests in Seattle, which everybody you know glorifies in this in this state or to some degree, that's like fifty thousand yeah. people. Yeah. So four times that. Four same. times that size in that in yeah. Seattle. You know, I mean, that, that, that that's a big protest march, and this is yeah. they had for for over one hundred forty days they had daily protests against the kids. That's right. And, and, and this is in the face of huge amounts of police re repression. Remember yeah. too that the and the American embassy when this comes up is that, for instance, the nine journalists that have been killed. Well, that's discounted because we don't know how many of them were political and there's gang activity, there's a lot of gang activity, there's a lot of crime. Mm -hmm. So they put all these human rights things, they put into right. the, to the crime basket, right. you see, and that's the way, and it's always been like that in yeah. Honduras. And then you come up with, well, what about the teacher strike? Because their pension funds, 40% of their pension funds disappeared. Mm -hmm. And the teachers went on strike. Yeah. And the, the, these people are incredibly corrupt. They are raiding the government. Yeah. And, and it was kind of like, well, you know, that uh, it's always been like that. That's the way it is in Honduras. That's the yeah. way it is. Yeah. So, so uh, people who want to find out what's really going on have to get beyond those, those the kinds of... The way it is. Yeah, well, beyond <laughs> the, the U.S. reporting right. oh, that yeah. distorts right. things yeah. in that oh, yeah. way oh, and, yeah. and find alternative sources. Right, um, right, right. So in in November of 2009, there was an election that was already had been scheduled, mm -hmm. and that was to produce a, a new president, and so forth. And the guy that got elected is uh, Porfirio Lobo, who's known as Pepe Lobo, and um, the that election seemed to fool the United States government. And a lot and of other, and other governments Moody, also. And some other governments. Yeah. And the, the EU Moody now recognizes Into those. thinking, oh, now they have democracy again, that's okay. But it was a, it was a crooked election. It was a sham election. Ooh. And you, you've told me, both of you told me on the phone when we were preparing for the show about the Carter Center refused to send Nobody, observers because they knew it was no corrupt. No international observers whatsoever. Yeah. Except the ones 
that the elite asked to come. Right. There the, were a right wing from Sweden. The, the right That's wing. That's not easy to find yeah, either. Yeah. The, so the, the right wing that, that, that wanted to rubber stamp a right wing election outcome, mm -hmm. but as far as neutral, there were no credible there were no neutral. observers, yeah. they, they all knew it was a sham right. and they right. stayed away. Right. But and it, it was, was boycotted. But yeah, it was and the reported. People boycotted. But it was reported in the United States and also by Lobos himself. That same day, he went and said, "Oh, we've won by sixty percent." Yeah. Well, sixty percent of what? Then it turned out that when you actually looked at the figures, thirty percent of the people voted, or forty percent. And so then yeah. you figure, well, sixty percent of forty percent that gives us twenty-four percent. Yeah. I mean, it's, and so it's just totally. And but they like we like the United States government likes. The fact that there's been an election. Yeah, and, and so now everybody wants to put this behind us. And oh, yeah. you know, Obama says, oh, let, we have to turn the page and go beyond. And Hillary Clinton was down there twisting arms and In the bullying OAS. people. She went, to, she went to the last meeting, the most recent meeting of the OAS, and she told them that they had to let Honduras back in, that they'd had an election, and that everything was fine, and et cetera, et cetera. And the OAS refused. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. The OAS has refused, and, and the OAS isn't, doesn't take take a being pushed around as easily anymore, yeah. um, and neither does neither do most of the Latin American nations. And, and why should they? They should. They have their own two feet. They can stand on their own, yeah. and, and you know, and they're tired of being banana republic for the United States. Yeah. And and remember, there's always been a tradition in in Central America. Certainly, there was when I was there a lot in the 80s and early 90s of what they called the grapevine. Mm -hmm. And things would happen, there'd be a massacre in, in El Salvador, and people would know about it in Guatemala, and it had mm -hmm. never been on the news. Yeah. And, and so the, this, this whole idea of having their own red, what they call a red, what do you call it, uh, sort of connections, you know, uh -huh. is, is they have that all set up, and they've had that in Honduras for years anyway. Now, tell us about the the resistance. There's also an organized resistance. Oh wow! Um, and and the the best known part is is the Frente, mm -hmm. the Front, Frente. I guess. Yeah. And and that seems to have a lot of different parts of the resistance, and it's been nonviolent. And it's de democratic. And democratic, yes. It's tell very us, interesting. Tell us about the Frente. Well, Either. well, they have they they have smaller groups that feed in to larger groups, and they, they have the, the teachers, the workers, the indigenous people, uh, and they've organized also by, by areas in the country, and so with these clandestine radios and things like that, and they're constantly pushing back, and it's, it's very impressive. They have groups there, like Cobate, Copate, Copate, uh, which is actually set up in the 80s, which we had visited when I was there in 89, and the same woman who was <laughs> there, you mm -hmm. know, and I said, you were here. But anyway, and they have, that's for the disappeared, because they had people disappear in the 80s. Mm -hmm. with They set up death squads in Honduras, and it, the Hondurans feel that the death squads were set up by the ambassador to Honduras from the United States, who is John Negro Ponte. And he's still around. Oh, he's going to be teaching at Yale in the fall. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he, he's just this notorious, notorious. human rights abuser mm -hmm. who, who shows up in many of these yes. Uh, yes. horrible yeah. things, and yet he's never treated as a war criminal or a, a right. pariah. And then they have this man on television, uh, Billy La Jolla, I think his name is, very attractive man, and he was part of the death squads in the 80s. Notorious huh. in all huh. of Central America. Yeah. And and the, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. I I think you know the Frente is a is a is a movement, and you know, and I and I and I think that I never really knew what a movement was until I I came across the Frente. Because in the United in the United States, we had, lately it's kind of been a couch term to some degree. It's like any time you have a coalition, or a, sometimes even like an issue, you call it a movement. You know, I'm working on the uh, I don't know anti-war movement, but it's not so much a movement as much the the Honduras has a movement. It's every different 
actor has decided to come together. They were there before. They may have grown a lot. But they were there before, but they all started working together. Mm -hmm. And they had some very simple issues. That the, they decided, you know, it's over 50 different groups. And they coordinate together, and they, they, they're like, okay, we need to decide on the lowest common denominator, you know. Well, what do we want? We want a new constitutional assembly uh, to, to be had. And we want to have a uh, Zelaya put back into power. That was the original thing, to have Zelaya mm -hmm. Uh, return to power. And that, of course, didn't happen. But now they are demanding that he re is allowed to return to the country because he was thrown out of the country yeah. during the inauguration of Lobo. And, and this is like, these are people who are very committed to, the, to their cause, and, they, and, they, and there's millions of them. Mm -hmm. And they're diverse, then, like you said, it, it has different elements oh. within it, but they, they can come together about what they have in common. Mm -hmm. right? And move that ahead. Right. Uh, I, I told you about the the grandmother that we met outside the mall, and oh, we yes. were looking at a map of Tegucigalpa trying to find places, and she just offered this, went into the spontaneous thing about the government. This is the most corrupt government. All this in Spanish, and you know this is the most corrupt government we've ever had. These people do not care about the poor. They are taking everything they can out of the country. They are totally indifferent to any of us, except their own little, you know, areas. And there was like a ceremony I went to where they took, they had uh, for the Frente, when, when Zelaya was forced to leave the country on the day of the inauguration of Lobo, Zelaya flew out of the airport and Lobo was being inaugurated in a stadium. There's 200,000 people who marched to the airport to see his plane fly off. Um, he was, you know, the, they took his presidential sash which is something that they put on, on the president. And that day, they, the day of Pepe Lobo's inauguration, they took the sash and they gave it to two people. One was the grandmother of the revolution, which is this, this lady who's been to every single protest, been active on the streets every, every, every day, and also this little kid who's like six years old, who gets up on the stage and just gives a fighter he gives off fiery rhetoric talking about how, uh -huh. you know, this, the, the, this was a coup and, and, like, you know, we need to get rid of, rid, rid of the dictatorship and we need to fight for, you know, uh -huh. we fight. So the, um, uh, in mid-September, they came up with the petition drive uh, reached its fruition. That, oh, this is a recent, recent development. Yeah, so this was... Mi they're, I they're had not even heard about it when I was there, actually, but they have evidently, they've had this, I mean, they have so much going on on so many different fronts. That's why this name called it the front is really nice, because <laughs> it has all different <laughs> fronts. And uh, so they have this petition drive to... Um, all right. To have a constitutional assembly. It's like a... Right. And, the, uh, the one that they were denied. Yeah, yeah. Right? And yeah. so they, and they have over, I mean, there was one report, oh, there were 900,000. Well, then they had one million and a quarter. Mm -hmm. yeah. One million and a quarter yeah. people had signed this petition. They had gone out, Clandon, you understand yeah, this yeah. is all Clandon's yeah. thing. They had gone out and collected all these signatures. Yeah. And now they are presenting this petition to the OAS and to mm -hmm. the UN yeah. and inside the country. They're taking it yeah. right to, you know, hey, we have this petition. What yeah. are you going to do about it? And, of course, it's, I gather it's not being reported in the newspapers right. there. Or here. Or here. Or here. here. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. But that's I mean, me imagine, 11 million people, yeah. and that includes children, okay, mm -hmm. and that they can get a million and a quarter yeah. signatures yeah. like that. To, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, with half the population being under 15. Right. I mean, this is, this is just extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and in the face of the repression from the violent government that's trying to suppress democracy. Right. And yeah. make money. And make and, and yeah. you have to understand right. there's a big appeal to there are many franchises in in uh, in Honduras. I mean they have McDonald's, they have a uh, Burger King, they yeah. have you know I don't know if they Kentucky Fried Chicken. I yes. didn't see that one. Uh, and these guys, they there are Hondurans running this who are making money. Uh -huh. And what I heard is that there are twenty five thousand military, or maybe that's police. There are ten thousand police, something like that. There are 60,000 security guards in Honduras. They advertised in Colombia for paramilitary to protect the wealthy families. And mm -hmm. so 
there are just lots. And I asked in the embassy, I asked about that, and he said, oh, they hadn't heard about that. Well, guess yeah. who guards the embassy? Yeah. A security firm. Right. Yeah, you one, one of you told me that, that, that people have been hearing Colombian accents. Yeah. Down mm -hmm. in, yeah, that's in, what they, uh, that they yeah, and they can, yeah. I couldn't tell a Colombian accent from, you know, probably, maybe I could tell a Mexican accent, not a Colombian. But, I mean, um, yeah. It, the, it's, it's just a funny thing, you know, it's like the, you know, in the U.S. media talking about Chavez's influence in, in uh, Honduras, you know, Chavez, didn't have any sort of influence on Honduras, really. I mean, like, you know, he was helping them to, uh, you know, help the poor out of the country. But Colombia's influence in, Hon in Honduras is, is just awful. They're just the, the worst human yeah. rights abusers in, yeah. in the Western Hemisphere. Right, yeah. And now the president of Colombia is getting along with, with Chavez, which, believe me, has Washington, D.C. plenty worried. Uh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going to be something yep. to watch. Yeah. So let's look at the larger context here. Uh, certainly the United States, as we've said, has this long history of dominating and both militarily and economically and certainly then politically. Um, and Canada has mining interests oh, yeah. that, that mm -hmm. one or both of you told me about on the phone when we were preparing for the program. And not just in Honduras, in all of Central America and, and in Colombia. And Canada has taken sort of a rightward political tack. Well, whatever the United, we're right, they're right behind the United States and all of it. Yeah. And then I told you that that uh, I read this little item in the English Weekly out of Honduras about Carlos Slim, who is the richest man in the world, who's Mexican, and Bill Clinton traveling to Honduras to look at investment opportunities. Hmm. And there's this big push to put a, a cruise ship complex in the northern part yeah. of Honduras on, on, the, on the Caribbean, Caribbean. Oh, right yeah. and this is you know and of course and the indigenous people are fighting this the indigenous people are fighting the the mining because of course the water goes right. you know it's 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 a very I yeah. mean they want to open it up to total exploitation yeah, you know? so, yeah. Um, the the um, uh, Somebody, when, and I forget, when, one or the other of you had said that, that this was kind of like an experiment. I think a few minutes ago you oh, had said no, this, that this, was this was... Oh, that was This was... Did uh, you hear that from Almendares? Uh, um, he, said, yeah. he said to us, and another, a woman did too, Berta did too, of the indigenous movement, that they said, you know, this is an experiment. It's, Central America is watching this to see what happens here. And so this is an experiment that, that other, other Central American countries had better watch out yeah. because this could, I mean, right now in Nicaragua, of course, there's, um, what's it, oh, the old Sandinista guy. Yeah, Ortega. And, uh, Ortega. And then there's an FMLN ex-commander in yeah. charge in, or the president yeah. in, in Salvador, yeah. and then Guatemala, and, and then Costa Rica, of course. But, but I mean, there are, there are mining companies in all these countries yeah. now. And, and so it's like, how much, you know, are, are they going to get away with? I yeah. mean, Guatemala is full of maquilla, maquilas in Guatemala right. City. Yeah, that's yeah. the low Salvador, wage, the low wage right. work but zones. Right, but they have an actual, they call it a free trade zone. Right. And it's set up, and it's American-inspired and American. The money comes back in here, and, yeah. you know, it's like, it's like outsourcing. Right, right. right. And and when you know, when we say that the that the U.S. could stop this and reverse this coup at any time, it's because Honduras is economically uh, tied to the United States. You know, most of their trade goes to the United States, right. and also Honduras gets a lot of remittances from yeah. the United States. Family members who are up here working mm -hmm. and send money back home. And exactly. And American like, business pay no taxes. In Honduras, they pay no taxes in Honduras. Oh. That the businesses pay no taxes, and so where the source of money is, is really from this exploitation. Yeah. yeah. You know? And it's like we'll see if this is successful. Still, you know, that's sometimes we you, you you could look at this and say like, okay, well, you know, the the coup people have won, but they haven't won. the The country is 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 totally unstable, and uh, and they're. There, the fight has is continuing, even whether with or without the U.S. watching. Yeah, 
you know, the fight will continue with or without the the people of conscious in the United States paying attention to it. And they're they're hurting economically too because of the general downturn in the in the world, so yeah. to speak. So so Honduras is keeping on pushing. Oh, we're going to get yeah. we know it's going to you know it's going to turn around. We're going to turn it around. But th but they're pushing on that uh, the kind of economics that have shown to be failing. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, it's, well, it's that exploitation you, of low depends wage. Depends who you talk to. Depends, yeah, some people are doing very well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, where could people get more information? I know there's a lot of stuff. I did a lot of background reading for this. You folks are both very well informed. You've been there yeah. firsthand. Um, uh, and I know there are organizations that send delegations down there so people can learn firsthand and connect with people. What, right. what else would you recommend for people to get informed? Well, I, I like the website Upside Down World, which okay. is, if you turn the world upside down, then Latin America's at the top. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's a wonderful source of news for all of Latin America, but they also have a list at the side of their news with all the countries. So any country you want to find out about, you just sit on mm -hmm. that and you can get what's happening. Mm -hmm. There's also a newly started Honduras Solidarity Network. Mm -hmm. And um, and it, if people are interested in going to Honduras and seeing for this, the themselves the empowering struggle of the social movements there um, then you know as part of uh, a local organization Latin American Solidarity Organization out of Olympia here in Media Island we uh, you know we would love to help support people to go down there I mean, mm -hmm. and they're looking for a company years mm -hmm. they need Pe a company years because of the do, human rights situation and the company years are people who go down and they a stay yeah. with the people who are at risk because they've been outspoken Rather, as a journalist there, there was or a an priest, organizer. Father Melo, that, um, that was, they made, put a plea out for accompaniment for him in June because yeah. he was being constantly, I mean, you know, death threats, people watching you, right. and you know, all yeah. sorts of things. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know what's happened with him. I thought he, yeah. somebody said he had to leave the country. I'm not sure. Yeah, but a lot, a lot of those Thank people will, will not keep a regular schedule, not right. travel in the same car. Right more than once and, and do all these. But at the same time, they have, it's not as desperate as, well, I was in Haiti after they overthrew Aristide with the junta. It's not that sort of desperation, you know. It's, it's uh, we saw a wonderful mural in the in the workers, of uh, this big workers place where they meet. And there's where this artist had, and he explained the entire mural to us. Uh -huh. I mean, there it was, you know. This, uh -huh. And he's selling pieces uh -huh. of this, you know, mural. Yeah. Uh, it's just fantastic. Well, so part, uh, part of the success about what people can do then is to actually um, uh, connect and show support for people who are yeah. doing it rather than cower in fear. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is, is they say, well, we don't have, you know, they've taken over the media. But what they've done is their media is the graffiti. Uh -huh. And so you drive down the street, and I, and I kept on seeing these buildings being painted, and I thought, wow, Honduras isn't as poor as I remember. And then I realized what they were doing is they were painting over the constant graffiti. Because yeah. they would paint it over and there'd be graffiti there. And, you know. and I would yeah. check out the Alliance for Global Justice as another good mm -hmm. website for it, uh, okay. information about Honduras. Okay. How about well, and we'll have some more websites listed at the end with okay. credits. Uh, uh, the Council on Hemispheric Affairs, Witness for Peace, School of the Americas Watch. A lot of these people, a lot of these thugs in the militaries were all trained. Five, all five generals, all uh, five generals coup? in Honduras involved in the and, coup, particularly the one who took them yeah. out. All five of them were yeah. trained at School of the Americas. In Fort Benning, Georgia with our tax dollars. So the United right. States Army is training thugs and human rights abusers mm -hmm. and we've been doing this in country after country after country and they it's not like an accident no that's got it that's part of the curriculum in fact i remember some years ago it was exposed that uh, that they had you know training manuals about how to assassinate local leaders and, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and things yeah. so yeah. Uh, it's really yeah. something mm -hmm. could each of you offer a closing thought and then we'll wrap this thing up well, one of the things that strikes you with you when you come across these people in the front frente is that they're not like we are. They're not waiting for it to be given to them. They're going to take it mm -hmm. because it belongs to them. Now they're nonviolent, but they're not. They're not giving way, mm -hmm. and and they're losing people, and they're still they're still there. Uh -huh. 
and 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 this one woman said to me, she said, she said, when you go home, tell people we're still here. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> I really yeah. liked that. Uh -huh. We're still here. Yeah, I appreciate one of the things I like about uh, in in Central America is people will actually stand up for themselves and stand up for democracy. Here in this country, people say, well, what's going to be politically feasible? And mm -hmm. then they scale way back from what we want and, and say, well, let's, let's see if we can settle for something very modest that's politically feasible. And there the people stand up for what they really but want. But remember, for many of them, they have nothing to lose. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you know, th th what they have going on Their there lives. Is, yeah. uh, is, is powerful. It, the movement's very strong, you know, and this yeah. is a this is self-funded. These are people. These are mothers. These are children. These are grandmothers, and they all go out there and they work their jobs. They take care of the family, and then they go and do a third job, which is they they protest in the streets mm -hmm. daily. And like it's it's a matter of, of civic duty for them. It's a matter yeah. of pride, and you know it really counteracts all the money that that the U.S. gives. Gives the right wing, the right wing people, and the coup mongers, and, and how much money the coup yeah. people make? Because yeah. you know, and you. Steel. I mean, when you think about it, there's no amount of money that can like stop motivated people from right. like committing to change. Great. I want to thank uh, Nina Morano and Bruce Wilkinson. I want to thank all the folks who've been watching the program. In the United States, we say that we support democracy and human rights. We say that we oppose violence, but our government actually provided political support for the violent military coup that overthrew democracy in, uh, in Honduras and, and overthrew the democratically elected President Zelaya. And the United States government has been pressuring other countries to pretend that the phony election was a real election and that everything is okay now. This is the old policy that the United States government has been doing for decades. President Obama campaigned for change, but we're getting more of the same old stuff. The American people must absolutely insist upon democracy and human rights for everybody. Don't expect the government to do it. We have to make this happen. We want to thank uh, Nina and Bruce, thank the folks who have been watching. Beyond this month's topic, if you want information about other aspects of, uh, and issues for peace, social justice, and nonviolence, you can contact the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at www.olympiafor.org. We're all one human family. We're all one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks. <laughs>